President Biden has declared a state of emergency in Mississippi, the western part, part of that state, reeling from a weekend tornado that killed more than two dozen people. The massive twister was on the ground for more than an hour. The storm tore through several communities, including the town of Rolling Fork. That's just over the Louisiana state line and west of Jackson, Mississippi. Uh, the powerful winds destroyed a part of the town. Volunteers are on the ground offering desperately needed food and water to storm victims. Arlana Zach spoke to one woman who rode out the storm in a restaurant freezer. I was screaming at I told everybody to say their name. I called their name and I just said, tell me you're here. And they were, call were calling their name and when we got the last one in, then I went in and then my husband came in and he was holding the door and it got away from him. The and, wind is pulling it. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how, but he got it back. And when he got it here, he looked up and he said, as he's closing it, he said, I see the sky. And so that meant our roof was gone. And Lana Zach joins us now from Rolling Fork, Mississippi, one of the hardest hit towns in that hard hit area. Lana, we just heard from the owner of Chuck's Dairy Bar there. They rode out the storm in a freezer, but someone was unable to make it into that refrigerated unit, whatever it was, to find shelter. How did they describe uh, those moments to you? Hey there, Tony and Lilia. It was harrowing, and I could see on Tracy Harden's face, that's the owner of the dairy bar, um, the terror being relived as she was telling me about it. And one, she got all of her employees into that cooler. And it, it was this small space. And it's incredible that with all the supplies, the restaurant supplies that were in the cooler, that they were able to pile in there. But she saw in just that last second before they closed the door, one of her neighbors running towards their building. She spent the next few moments terrified about not only whether they were going to make it through as, as winds were hitting their, uh, that cooler. Cooler, but what happened to that neighbor? Let's listen to more of what Tracy had to say. As we're all going in the cooler, I, I don't know why, but I look back at the video cameras and I see her running through the door. And do you know? We don't know where she went. Oh. Um, so when we got in and we stopped moving, I called her phone and she said she was in the bathroom and she was okay. Oh. And then, How did you feel in that moment? We were all okay. <sighs> So, Tracy, you could see that she cared not only about the people who were part of her establishment, but also people who were part of the community. And just behind her, the entire um, area was wiped out. And she knew all of those families that lived in those trailer homes in the motel. She knew them by name. She knew about the kids. She knew who was still missing. And she was so concerned about all of them. And that's part of what we continue to see here as a community um, is not only mourning the devastation to their homes and businesses, but also knowing those people, those lives that were lost. Lana, of course, that destruction is, is so hard to see. Um, and as you mentioned, the first thing that happens is that a community comes together. This is clearly a tight-knit community. Um, can you talk to us a little bit about just what those first steps towards recovery have been, or what do they need? So uh, you, can, you can see here, this used to be a home. All of these were homes, and there are little tales that are, are told and all the things that are left behind. There's a kitchen right back here, and you can see that there's still dishes, china, neatly piled up in that cupboard. Uh, but then just across the way, there's a car that's been picked up flipped onto its top. Um, just across the way on the other side of the camera, I could show you on our drone footage, you can see a semi, one toppled on top of the other. The devastation here, when we're talking about recovery, has to be put into context. This entire town of about 2,000 people, for the most part, has been wiped out entirely. It's gone. But that said, there are bulldozers all over. There are people who I've spoken with who have come from all these different neighboring states who are all just pitching in, trying to help. And then there are a couple of signs of the city that's going to rebuild. We, we stopped by the Stop and Shop. It is one of the only buildings, one of the only uh, places that is still open. They got 
got a generator from a friend in another state uh, that, that brought it up there. They've got um, diesel that's coming in. And so they were able to open their doors to the patrons and they even had music playing. And one of the women that I spoke with who works there said that they are going to build back. They are, they are entirely committed to it. Um, and then she choked back tears as she, as she remembered that there are some people, people that she knows that, that won't be coming back. And that's part of the, the fierce will that you see and the deep sadness that's on display, uh, even as everybody's working together to try and bring back this town, Tony and Lilia. Yeah, Lana, some people will not be coming back and nothing will change that, but the town itself will recover. There's resolve to do so. And when you mention music, one of the funny things about the aftermath of a storm like that is that there is music in chainsaws and in earth movers because that's the process of rebuilding. Uh, but that was an area mm. where people didn't necessarily have the extra money to batten down this or reinforce that. Um, how does poverty in that area, to put a fine point on it, complicate the effort to clean up and rebuild. Poverty and race are both part of those factors, Tony. And I'm glad you mentioned music because Rolling Fork was actually a stop on the Blues Trail. So they would sometimes get tourists through here and they're committed to having their October festival that they always have. Um, but this is one of the poorest communities uh, in America, this, this county. 35% live below the poverty line, at or below the poverty line. Um, we do know that President Biden has signed that, uh, that disaster declaration that's helped pay the way to bring in all these trucks. Uh, we can see just off of my shoulder here that they are starting to restring these lights. Right now, they don't have power. They don't have water. They don't have any of their community services. So there are some people who um, sadly probably don't have insurance. I've been asking that uh, of folks. A lot of these are multi-generational families where the homes have been passed down from generation to generation. And, uh, and one of the people I spoke with said, this is going to take a generation to try and mm. rebuild. And certainly the problems with the complication of finances is going to be part of that because a lot of the people who lived in this community came to this community when there was still um, the elastics factory here. And they told me that since that factory closed, they don't have the same jobs that they used to. There isn't that same sort of of economic um, engine that exists here in Rolling Fork. So that's going to be one of the complicating things. But just the same, the people that I spoke with by large were saying that they're committed to rebuilding. They're committed to getting their town back because they love Rolling Fork and they love their neighbors. Yeah, Lana, a music festival on the calendar is something to look forward to. I hope they can rebuild and, and point themselves to that, that milestone. Lana Zach, thank you very much.